Okay, I want to um, just tie up a couple of loose ends. Um, we had this thing on shape casting processes. This is just kind of a thing that lists the genealogy of a bunch of these things. And you can have, they break it down into an expendable mold, which would be sand casting. We talked about that. Or a metal mold, which would be like high pressure die casting. And we talked about the semi solid stuff that's like your Slurpee or your soft ice cream, where you actually take out half, part of the half the heat of fusion before you actually push it into a, a metal die. And then uh, um, Mike, not uh, Matt, yeah, um, uh, Mike Tarkanian brought in the wooden molds for, for the sand casting. And the sand casting has been around for, for centuries if not millennia, I guess. Um, and there's green sand and, and stuff, but one of these in here, if I can find it, oh, it's down here. Expendable mold, expendable mold with expendable pattern casting. We talked about investment casting where you have an expendable pattern, which is the, pla the, the plastic part, the, the wax part that you mold. Uh, we didn't talk about lost foam. Uh, we did talk about this semi-solid over here. So some of these things, investment casting goes back thousands of years. Um, sand casting, bonded sand molding goes back thousands of years. Lost foam goes back to 1960 at MIT. But the interesting thing about this one, it wasn't invented by a scientist, okay? Professor Fleming's had the foundry, and I think I told you about the foundry. MIT had a real foundry, and they cast the gimbals for the space shots and stuff in the 60s. So this artist from the Boston area comes in, Anthony E. Urbino or something, I think, well, I can't remember if that's his name. Anyway, he comes in and he had, he didn't, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't a scientist or a foundryman, but he did, he did sculpture. And he had decided to sculpt something in styrofoam and then pour the sand around the styrofoam and then pour the molten metal in and just let the styrofoam evaporate from the hot metal. And he was partially successful, but he wasn't completely successful in doing this. But he brings this in to, to MIT and says, can you help me perfect this? I can't, I can't get consistent quality and, and stuff. And so it turns out Professor Fleming kind of looks at it and says, hmm, that's an interesting idea. And so you have to understand how the, the, the when you pour the metal in, how it flows into the mold and things, and where you should put the, the spout where you're going to pour the, you know, the pouring um, cavity. And, and so you have to understand some of that fluid flow. And so MIT helped him uh, perfect this. But that is now called lost foam casting. And in fact, most of your engine block, most of your cast iron engine blocks for General Motors are made that way now. They make a styrofoam engine block and then they just sort of push that down the line, pour a bunch of sand on top of it, okay? They don't, they don't have a cope and a drag now, okay? Where you put the, the two, two halves of the, the thing together to make a cavity. The styrofoam is the cavity, and when you pour the hot cast iron in, it just vaporizes. Now you have to worry about, it. you know, you got gas vapors coming out and you got liquid metal coming in, you gotta make sure you don't get a little explosion, and, you know, spatter everything everywhere and blow up your mold, but it does work and it's now a major industrial process. But it was because an artist came to Professor Fleming with a, with a clever idea. Um, but Fleming's developed all of this. Uh, lost foam is here. Um, shape casting, oh, investment casting. We talked about and I passed around this. <coughs> okay, the turbine blade. Um, this was really sort of perfected by a guy, guy Bud Schenck at Pratt & Whitney. But before he went to Pratt & Whitney, he was a professor here at MIT. Uh, and that was in the 60s, okay, um, to kind of make some of these types of parts. And in fact, the guy who um, made the ceramic inserts that you cast, around, cast this thing around is also a, an MIT ceramist grad um, and started a little firm to make those ceramic parts, which are very fragile. I actually have one in my office, maybe I'll I'll remember to bring it. Um, so anyway, MIT has sort of an interesting history and the whole shape casting processes go back thousands of years or several tens of years depending on what you're looking at. But I just wanted to give you a little idea of the significance of some MIT history 
and these um, shape casting processes. This, uh, we don't, I don't have to show you that. Um, oh, I, what I wanted to say about this investment casting, I want to talk a little bit about the economics. Anybody know what a jet engine costs, roughly? Pardon me? Not a billion. Oh, you mean to build a new one? To design a new one is a billion dollars, but... No, I said a million. Oh, a million. Oh, a million. It's about five, it's between five and ten if you... Well, you can get a small one on a small jet for a million. Yeah, okay. If you're talking a 747 engine or 737, they're about five million bucks, okay? Um, you said you said F-16? F-18s. F-18s. I'm assuming it's yeah, very okay. Um, anyway, well, I would have... I don't, I don't know the F-18. A million bucks seems a, a little cheap to me because <coughs> these blades, if you're really getting to active air cooling with these fancy passages, each blade's about $6,000. There's about 100 of them that go around the rotor, okay? And you typically have anywhere from two to five stages. And you're talking about a half a million dollars a stage just for the blades. So that's where half of the value of that engine, if it's a $5 million engine, and I suspect that if it's a $1 million engine, it may even be a little bit more than half. Um, they're all sizes of engines, okay? So you're, you're right, it's order of magnitude of a million, but it's really about five, for a, a, a big commercial jet, it's five or $10 million. So if it costs, I don't know, $250 million to buy a 747, Paracera show they just trotted out the 747-8, it's a four-engine jet, okay? Um, well, you got $40 million worth of engines on there, four engines, right? Anyway, it turns out that this is, it's not the most critical co component because if you lose a blade, you only lose an engine, and losing one engine is not a big deal when you got four. If you go back to the old B-52s, they had eight engines, and that was partly because you could afford redundancy in the 1950s, okay? You can't afford the fuel to fly them anymore, <laughs> okay? But, uh, oh, so you lose an engine, big deal. You got another seven, right? Um, well, it turns out the 777, which would have come out about in the early 90s or something for Boeing, it was the first two-engine commercial aircraft qualified to fly across the ocean. And by flying across the ocean, they mean two hours from land, okay? And it used to be you could, if you wanted, you could fly up over Iceland and Greenland and down through Gander, Newfoundland and stuff, and you could make it from Europe to the United States in a two-engine plane, but the FAA wouldn't certify you uh, for that until the early 90s, the reliability of the engines went up so they decided, even if you lost one engine, uh, the odds are you're not going to lose a second engine. Okay, but in the old days, when the reliability wasn't quite as good, you had, you know, uh, four engines on a 747. Of course, in the military, there are some aircraft, like, in the F-15, wasn't it two engines? Okay, of course, that doubles the cost. And then the F-16, of course, was supposed to be the low-cost, you know, make a bunch of them, and that was a single engine. Uh, and if you lose your engine, well, you, hopefully the pilot ejects, and if he doesn't, you, you know, funerals aren't that expensive, uh, I guess. Anyway, <coughs> um, uh, well, it's true, <laughs> okay? <laughs> There's an economic analysis to all of this, uh, whether, it's, whether it's nice or not, but it's real, <laughs> okay? Um, the turbine blades constitute 20% of one of the big engine manufacturers, General Electric, of their revenue, but 40% of the profits. So these are, not anybody, just anybody can go out and make one of these things, okay? There's a lot of technology, a lot of know-how, and if it's commercial, you gotta get the FAA approval. So um, the, the OEM companies, uh, you know what OEM stands for, Original Equipment Manufacturer, so the Pratt, the GE, the Rolls-Royce, they guard this viciously, okay? Because this is 40% of their profit. This is the, the core of their business, if you will, is to make these castings. And in fact, the American Institute of Physics came up with um, the 20 greatest uh, achievements in physics of the 20th century, and it turns out they included 
the metallurgy of making these things as, as a triumph of physics, okay? I mean, some of the metallurgists thought, really? That's phys physics? Okay, the physicists couldn't even spell metal, okay? Um, but anyway. Um, so just to give you an idea of the cost of these things, turns out the CFM 56 engine, which is on the 737 and a bunch of Airbuses and stuff, is the most widely used commercial engine in the world. It has two stages. And that's, you know, so they've designed it uh, to have fewer, the fewer stages, the, the better off you are, obviously. Now the critical components on an engine, the ones they really worry about, are things like the big rotors that those things go on, okay? Or the shafts. You lose a shaft or you lose a rotor, you lose the engine because when that one of those things breaks, there's enough energy in one of those big heavy things that it just goes through, it'll cut the plane right into it. In fact, that's the Sioux City, Iowa problem. They had a rotor failure um, and uh, it went through and it cut all the control cables and the pilot had to basically fly without any of his flaps. Okay, he had to land without any flaps, flaps or regular control surfaces. Um, so the FAA spends lots of time on defects and fatigue crack growth in rotors and, um, and in shafts because these things weigh hundreds of pounds. But frankly, this is not a critical component. You lose one blade and you might lose the engine because one of these things going through your engine towards, tends to wipe out a lot of the other blades. Um, but just because you lose one engine, and if, you're, if you have re enough reliability in your other engines, then you keep on flying. And you only need, if you're a two engine plane, like a 777, you only need two engines when you take off. You can fly just fine with one engine. In fact, I saw the statistics from General Electric once. The reliability expressed as um, a percentage of uptime per hour of flight was like 99.75 or something, you know? It's like one quarter of a percent, which means uh, once every 400 hours, you lose an engine in flight. Now, when you say lose an engine, it doesn't blow up or something, it just shuts down and you have to turn it off, okay? Or you have a fire or, or you lose a blade, and you know, you, it is sort of destroyed. Um, well, if you start thinking about it, how many of you have ever flown 400 hours? Okay, on commercial aircraft. I know I've flown more than 400 hours on commercial aircraft, so the odds are they were shutting down engines, but they didn't come over the loudspeaker to tell us, did they? Okay, well, we're going to shut down an engine because it's not working. You know, can you just imagine? <laughs> 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 anyway, um, <clears throat> you'd have a few upset people, no doubt. Well, I found I did leave them in my office. The south wire and the uh, uh, Hazlitt process that I tried to describe. Um, this actually is the proper, 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 proper ca casting machine. This is only a uh, two meter, so it's about six foot casting wheel, steel, and it's got a steel belt. And you basically pour metal in here. At 12 o'clock, it goes around, it solidifies on this water, you have a water spray on the outside of the steel belt, and you end up with a cast bar that comes out the top. Uh, if you look, on the uh, south wire process is not a lot different. <coughs> you, you pour it in here and it comes, goes around and comes out the top. Uh, this is 2.4 meters in diameter. It's a steel wheel, you have a, a spray band, and you end up with a bar. Here's the actual cross section of the bar. Here's the spray. So this is the steel. This is the cross section of the steel wheel. Okay. Um, here's the as cast rod, and you're going to break that down and turn it all into wire. And you can do this because what you're casting is copper, which has very good thermal conductivity, and you can get uh, something that's about two or three inches in diameter. Oh, here it is. Uh, 75 millimeters by 52. Well, 52 is about two by three, okay? 35 square centimeter uh, mold, okay? For the south wire process. <coughs> um, it works partly because what you're trying to cast has good thermal conductivity. It melts at less than 2,000, just under 2,000. And the steel band doesn't melt until 2,600. 
and if you keep water spray on it and it's a thin steel band the water spray keeps it cool enough that it doesn't fail if it does if the steel band does fail well you get a few few hundred pounds of copper molten copper on the floor of your cast shop and and you just clean it up okay which actually reminds me of a story back from when I was a student, an undergraduate student, okay, which I never saw, but one of my classmates, you know, went off for his summer internship, and he went to a, uh, I think it was Copper Weld Steel, which probably doesn't exist anymore, and actually, you hear the story, you'll understand why. Um, we talked about ingot casting in a steel mill and stuff, and uh, <coughs> there is a moral to the story. Um, so they were they were supposed to be doing doing ingot casting, and of course, even back in 1970 or whenever this was, uh, the the operators were often in an air conditioned pulpit. It gets pretty hot in the mill, and the guy running all the controls, he's just sitting there looking. It's like a nuclear reactor control room for a commercial nuclear reactor. You know, you can't even see the reactor. You're just in a room with a bunch of gauges and stuff, sitting at a little desk in an air conditioned room. And so uh, the guys running the melt shop are union guys back then in the steel industry, steel workers of America. And um, they got paid a lot of money, as I think I mentioned once before, um, probably more than a lot of the managers because they were responsible for hundreds of thousands of dollars an hour worth of steel and making sure it's cast properly. Well, one of the engineers overseeing the melt shop comes in and he, he looks at some of the gauges and he says, okay, tap the heat, which means cast it into the molds. And the guy says, but he says, oh no, he, the first time he comes in and says, go ahead and tap the heat. And then he walks out and he comes back about 15 minutes later and he looks up and he sees the gauges and he says, I told you to tap the heat. And the guy says, but he says, I told you to tap it, now tap it. So he did. Well, the reason he hadn't tapped it is because the railroad car that had all the casting molds had not come up to the casting station. <laughs> and so when he was ordered to cast it, he cast 200 tons of steel right on top of the railroad tracks. Okay? Well, he did what he was told. And, of course, the, the moral here is if you're the manager, you don't just order people around. You actually listen to what they're trying to tell you. And the other moral is if you're the laborer, you actually don't suspend common sense uh, just because you're trying to get back at a guy. They both lost their jobs, okay? Which is, except when you cast a couple hundred tons of steel on the railroad tracks, it takes about a week to clean up, okay? Um, How do you, I mean? That's sort of an interesting question in itself. You go in there with big steel lances, because steel is easy. Well, first of all, if you walk through one of these shops, it's about, the, the floor is dirt. And usually it's about two feet of sand, okay? And it, well, you're just casting in a big ca sand mold. It's like the old, the old Saugus Ironworks, the sow bar, okay? You're just pouring it into a sand floor, right? And it, well, it may be two, three inches thick as it you know, spread out and solidified as a pancake or a drop biscuit, I guess. You can think of it as a drop biscuit. But it weighs a couple hundred tons. This is a heavy biscuit. Um, so what you do is you go in with a, an oxyacetylene torch which you may have 100 PSI of oxygen behind it. It's got big tips. And you can go through, you can cut through two, two feet of steel with an oxyacetylene torch. Now, you may only go an inch a minute, but you can cut through, I've seen three feet of steel cut, okay? So, it's easy if it's steel. But the first year I was on the faculty, you know the little short door, you ever seen the 8137? as you go around the corner. That was my office. That was my first office as a faculty member. A little short door. Um, and so I'm sitting in the office and I get a phone call um, from some guy in Alabama who worked in an aluminum smelting shop, okay, or actually it's a found aluminum foundry. And they had a big holding pot for the aluminum and he said, uh, he called up and he says, well, I'm uh, trying to get some advice on how to cut aluminum. I said, well, you can, you can saw it. It's not hard to saw. And he said, uh, well, no, it's not going to work. I said, well, um, you can plasma cut it. And he said, no, no, I got something pretty thick. I said, uh, how thick is it? He says, about two feet. What happened is he had an electric furnace, and they lost power for a day. And so the big aluminum pot, which was about two feet deep and about four feet long and six feet wide or something, it's solidified. 
And so now he has a furnace that has got two feet of solid aluminum in it and he can't pour, the, pour it out of the furnace because it's solid, right? And I said, hmm, you do have a problem because you can't flame cut aluminum. It has a very protective oxide when you get to flame cutting in the other lecture. I'll explain why. But anyway, you can't flame cut it. So I didn't know the solution. I was only 26 years old. Um, but about 10 years, 15 years later, I was having dinner with uh, Peter Breidenbaugh, who at the time was senior executive VP of, of Alcoa. And I said, uh, I remembered this. And I said, Peter, you know, you have these big aluminum smelting pots where you make, you know, aluminum. And you must have freeze ups from time to time. What do you do? He says, well, there's this guy in Pittsburgh, OK? course that's the home of Alcoa and where the Pittsburgh Reduction Co Company which was the beginnings of Alcoa was called the Pittsburgh Reduction Company because they were reduce, reducing aluminum. Um, he says there's this guy in Pittsburgh and he will come and he will blow it for you okay and basically he'll dr drill some holes he'll put some charges in there and he'll blow it up and if he's good he won't blow up your furnace too he can break it up with an explosive charge, okay, if he's lucky. But it doesn't always work. This is sort of like, you ever heard about blowing out the oil wells when you have a, a wildcat well and they have Red Adair would come in with his crane full of explosives and he's trying to blow it out like a candle and stuff? Well, this is the guy who blows up the aluminum, the solid aluminum masses, okay. So I, th it was, I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, <coughs> so. It's good work if you can get it, but the probably world probably doesn't need too many of those people to do that. Okay, this is the Hazlitt process, which again is casting copper, big, big copper sheets a couple of inches thick, and you have two steel bands. Here's your molten copper comes in here. Big steel bands. This whole thing can be six feet wide <coughs> um, and maybe 10 or 12 feet long. You're going to cast it one inch thick. Okay, 1.25 centimeters. Well, actually, that's a half an inch thick. Anyway, um, water spray to take the heat out. Remember, you've got to extract the heat of fusion when you're casting. And here's uh, another picture of it, the lower belt coming up. And they basically just pour the, the uh, copper in here as the stuff is spinning. And just by um, the friction uh, and the viscosity of the liquid, you just pull it in there. And it solidifies, and it comes out, and you've got a big... Uh, big sheets of copper which you then put through an electrolytic process to make it pure okay so that's kind of specialized but it shows it, to me it's sort of amazing what people would do who would ever think that you're going to start pouring molten copper on a little eighth inch steel band with water spray and if you start thinking about well um, if you ever lost that, do you know what happens in a molten metal shop when water comes in contact with, uh, with molten metal? It's called an explosion. You generate steam very quickly, and that steam, as it expands, will blow molten metal all over everywhere. And so, um, I mean, I've had a number of times where someone calls up, we had an explosion in our casting facility. I said, where's the water? Okay. And because you have water-cooled molds, and you, you get a leak in one of those, and you've got a problem. Okay, I most recently was a year or two ago. Um, they had a big electric arc furnaces. We talked about the big electric arc furnaces, almost the size of this room, and these big three foot diameter, three and a half foot diameter carbon electrodes. Well, the walls they've they they used to make about 40 or 50 tons of steel in one of those vessels, but to increase productivity over the last 25 years, they've done all kinds of things and they put in new transformers and they get to 150 megawatts of power up from about 50 megawatts. And they go from 40 tons to 120 tons or 150 tons that they're melting. Well, when you start doing that, those are big arcs. Just think of an arc in the middle of, middle of this room that's about the size of a small car, okay, melting tons of steel. There's a lot of radiation to the walls. And when you triple the power, you triple the radiant energy to the walls. Well, in the old days, with small furnaces, they could have a ceramic wall. It might be two feet thick or something, and it would erode away over time, but you can go in and reline it every six months or whatever. Uh, well, to get it up to higher and higher, higher and higher power, they basically put in steel pipes about two, three inches in diameter, and they got water running through there at about a thousand gallons a minute. Okay, 
to extract the heat from the walls. It's just the radiant heat from these big arcs. Well, in this particular case, they had an arc that, so, well, so it's got this, it's uh, pipes with plates welded to them and another pipe. So you got a pipe here and a pipe here and in between you got a, a web of steel that, that holds everything together. And then on top of this whole thing, they spray on a, uh, a, a spray on ceramic coating, which might, is supposed to be three, four inches thick. Well, they didn't maintain the coating very well. And the question was, you got this bundle of 10 tons of steel scrap you're trying to melt over here. You actually got a bunch of them. It's kind of like kids blocks. You got 10 or 12 of these 10 ton bu bundles in there of solid that you're trying to melt and the arc comes down it's supposed to hit the bundle and come out to the other electrode in the bottom of the furnace but what happened is it jumped from the bundle to the wall because there is a gap in the ceramic coating and that arc which is supposed to be melting hundreds of pounds of steel a minute worked on the pipe pretty quickly, worked on the pipe pretty quickly and you had a hole this big now they have they have leaks from the walls little little leaks the size of your finger that spray a few gallons you know 10 gallons a minute or something in there so big deal just get a little steam coming out of the furnace but this one was a big leak uh, almost the diameter you know well it was a long thin one but it could let almost all the water into the furnace they had an explosion uh, the metal erupted turns to vapor and turns to a foam and six guys died okay um, in any case, so you do have in liquid metal shops, you, you have water very close to hot steel or hot, hot aluminum, hot copper, hot steel, whatever it is. And the real rule, if you talk to a fouldryman, the, the water always goes on top of the molten metal because that way the, the steam can come off. You never put the molten metal on top. That's the, 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 lay, the, that's the foundryman's view. Never, me, never put the metal on top of the water. Always put the water on top of the, the metal because that gives the steam somewhere to go. If you put the metal on top, you just generate steam underneath the molten metal and spray molten metal all over everywhere, okay? Uh, so these types of hazards exist and they, uh, uh, they do kill people, a few people every year. It's, it's sort of like a, a coal mine, you know, a certain number of mine, a few, we probably kill 50 or 100 miners a year, okay? It doesn't really hit the news because it's sort of one of those things that happens, okay? Uh, it's sort of like gas pipeline. We have gas pipelines all over the country and some of them have got 1,000 PSI gas in a 42 inch diameter pipe and usually when it blows up, it's in some farmer's field. It kills a couple of cows, okay? Uh, a few years ago, we had one in Edison, New Jersey, 600 foot flames and shooting up in the air in like a 60 story building in the middle of Edison, New Jersey at midnight. Woke a few people up, okay? Um, so failures occur and they can be pretty dramatic and, but fortunately they're not very common, okay? Um, other things, we talked about dendrites the other day, or, and um, we'll talk a little bit more about dendrites, but we, we talked about the, if you're solidifying an alloy, the alloy wants to uh, segregate, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. And you get these dendrites and in, in, uh, forming. What you'd like to do, if you have a great big casting, uh, you're casting a 200 ton ingot because you're going to forge some big big vessel or something. Um, you can have some pretty big dendrites the size of your fist, okay? Um, and you can have some pretty big inhomogeneities the size of your fist. Uh, I used to say that the size of the defect in a casting is proportional to the size of the casting. If you want to just say it's 2% uh, of the diameter uh, or you know the length characteristic size of the casting or whatever that's the size of the flaw. Um, I remember <coughs> one of my first uh, consulting jobs back in the 70s was MIT Lincoln Lab came in and they said we have this radar dome in Kwajalein in the Pacific and it turns out they had built this <coughs> for some scientific purposes 
but it just happened to be located in the perfect position whenever the Soviets were sending a, a satellite up into space from Middle Asia, they could see with this particular frequency of radar the boost phase and get a measure of the trajectory and they could figure out before it got into space what the orbit was going to be, okay? Because they could measure the arc coming up out of the boost phase of this rocket. Well, it turns out, um, so it had been built for scientific purposes. It was about the size of a football field, the dish, okay? And it, it ran around on these big steel railroad tracks so it could spin 360 degrees, take different views. Um, and it had big steel, what they call bogies, which hold railroad wheels. You know, it may have, I don't remember if it had eight or 16 wheels on each bogey. But it's just a great big, well, if you've been in a shipyard, you've seen big wheeled vehicles that carry 200 ton objects, you know, pieces of ships. Um, well, so it's, it's similar, this was railroad wheel rather than rubber tired wheels. Um, but anyway, they did, this thing was at about 3,000% um, of its useful life, okay? because it didn't have this original military application when they had built it for scientific purposes. They found out the military application and this thing was running, you know, around the clock 90% of the time. In fact, whenever it went down for repairs, it was classified because that was when the Soviets could have set something up without our knowing it, or knowing as quickly about what the orbit was going to be. So anyway, they come to me because one of these bogies needs to be replaced and the lead time to get the casting was one year. And that wasn't really acceptable uh, if this thing was going to be out for a year. The Soviets might have been able to learn that, okay? Um, so they, uh, they determined they could machine it out of 12 inch thick plate. And they could buy 12 inch plate fairly quickly. Uh, but they wanted to know how to specify the testing to make sure that they did all this machining on this thing to turn it into the shape they wanted, that they wouldn't end up running into some defect. Well, I remember I went and looked at the ASTM specs. The tightest specification for any plate above six inches that you could have for ultrasonic testing meant that the defect had to fit within a 12-inch diameter circle. Okay, so if you're if you're running ultrasonics across the top of the plate, if you find a defect, as long as the projection of that defect would fit within a 12-inch circle, it was an acceptable plate. Okay, so when I talk about fist-sized defects, when you get to really heavy sections, that's acceptable. Now it may not, because frankly, you saw the piping porosity or the pipe from the solidification of the ingot. And I showed you the football size defect in that, that, uh, that big shaft. When you make big things, you get big imperfections, okay? The converse of that is when you make small things, you have smaller imperfections, okay? And there's still a fraction of the diameter of whatever you're trying to make. So it turns out in the 1970s, actually the 1960s, the guy at Caltech took some iron boron alloys uh, that they're actually basically just brazing alloys, um, but they melt at a fairly low temperature, sort of like cast iron. And he took a spinning copper wheel, spinning at, uh, I don't remember how many surface feet per minute, but it's, it was like going around at like 60, well, if it's 60 miles an hour, it's going at 5,000 surface feet per minute, right? Or no, 50, yeah, yeah, yeah 5,000 surface feet per minute. So it's going at thousands of surface feet per minute, and they would pour the molten metal on here and it would come spinning off as a thin sheet if you did it right. You had to spray it on there, okay, as a liquid spray. Um, but if you did, you could actually roll off sheets and I've, I've lost my sheets. You can get these sheets that are 12, 6, 12 inches wide, about as thick as a piece of paper, rapidly solidified metal, and you lose all crystalline structure. You have no dendrites. Ordinarily, these things would be full of dendrites. But it's so thin, it cools so quickly, they call it rapid solidification. Well, duh, it is sort of rapid solidification. And in fact, in the best cases, they got solidification rates of a million degrees per second. Okay, so this thing's solidifying so fast 
that you end up getting a very homogeneous structure. It's not all that different than the Hazlitt process, except you don't even need a top band because it's just a thin layer and it's solidifying so fast that this thing only has to be about two inches long for you know a million degrees per second. You can in five thousand surface feet per minute you can calculate it, but you know only problem is you can only make thin sheets. Yeah. Right, but it depends on the like, which volume you are pouring the molten metal onto the wheel, though, right? So if you pour too much, you will have that thin sheets. Oh right, right. Like what's the maximum or what's the volume that they pour it on there? Well, the the problem is for the original alloys, you had to make sure that you poured it out so it came out as a big, wide, very thin stream that would then be thinned out by the spinning wheel. So you're sort of stretching the liquid out, if you will. And you wouldn't get, if you made it five, or, or let's say 10 thousandths of an inch thick, a quarter of a millimeter, that's too thick to get rapid solidification. And you wouldn't get an amorphous metal, you would get a crystalline, a semi-crystalline metal. And Professor Shu here now works on these kind of semi-crystalline metals. But since, I mean, the, the Defense Department and the National Science Foundation were spending hundreds of millions of dollars a year in the 1970s and early 1980s because these things were uniform. They had no grain boundaries. They had tremendous corrosion resistance, okay? It was like getting stainless steels without the chromium, okay? Um, they were strong, they had 500 KSI strength, it's just they were very thin. And you didn't have bulk material, okay? Um, and so, but they thought, okay, we'll figure out some way to consolidate it later, let's just study the properties. And so they were spending hundreds of millions of dollars on this. Um, well, did I tell you already about the golf clubs? I haven't told you about that, okay. Uh, it turns out the, uh, um, uh, so the, uh, <coughs> uh, another guy, a, a student who, of Paul Duez, who was the guy who discovered this at Caltech in the, in the early 60s or, or mid 60s, his student Bill Johnson, who's a faculty member at Caltech now, about my age, um, in about in the late 80s came up with bulk metallic glasses. He started throwing all kinds of other metalloids from that part of the periodic table in with the iron. And actually it wasn't just iron, it was iron beryllium alloys originally. Okay, beryllium's toxic, but he was able to make bulk metallic glasses so you could make things about the size of a golf ball. Um, and you could still get the, the amorphous structure. And so there is actually a company out there now, they haven't been all that successful, they've been around for 15 years now, trying to sell bulk metallic glasses. Because they never did all the way through the 1980s and 1990s. No one figured out how to consolidate these thin sheets into a solid bulk material. They tried explosive bonding where you just slam them together with an explosive charge. They tried everything and nothing worked. And still today nothing has worked except Bill Johnson has gotten some alloys that actually if you cool them at a hundred degrees centigrade per second, you can actually make them bulk. So you can get bigger things if you cast them the right way. Well, the only commercial product they've come up with are golf clubs, okay? The metal woods, okay? The same type of thing I passed around for investment casting out of stainless steel. And um, they've, they've been around for about 15 years. I always say you can sell anything to a golfer, okay? They will, usually golfers are a little older, they have a little more disposable income, and they will pay anything to be better than their other executive, you know, friend down the road to beat him in a golf game. So if they can get some advantage, they'll pay thousands of dollars for it. Well, so when I was department head 15 years ago, we were interviewing one of Johnson's postdocs for a potential faculty position. I said, well, uh, what, you know, what have you ever developed out of the, or I didn't say it that way, I said, well, what, what are the markets for this? He says, well, we've, we've made golf clubs. I said, anything else? He said, no. And I just learned about um, six months ago that they are selling the golf clubs, but apparently their fatigue life is such they get about 50 shots before it breaks. Okay, so. But you can sell anything to a golfer, you know. 50 shots, that's a whole round. If he beats his buddy, you know, it's worth $10,000, right? I mean, they, they may have a $50,000 bet on the game. I don't know. Um, but that's rapid solidification. Another way to do rapid solidification rather than sheets 
is atomization, making powders. Now we make probably five million tons of powder metallurgy, uh, steel, aluminum, other things each year. And what you do is you basically <clears throat> pour a molten stream and you hit it with a supersonic gas jet. Now getting the right type of jet is very important. <coughs> Professor Grant, who was a powder metallurgist here, passed away now, but uh, he was he was here in the 40s and 50s and all the way up until the, the 90s, okay? He was um, here for 50, over 50, well over 50 years as a faculty member. Professor Grant was a specialist in this and he had a patent on a, on a whistle where you basically had a little cavity and you blow the air in and it would come shooting out and you would get shock waves basically that would help break up these jets into very small powders and you're trying to solidify these powders Lots of surface to volume ratio. The smaller the diameter, the more surface to volume ratio it goes as one over R, right? The area, surface area is four pi R squared of a sphere and the volume is four thirds pi R cubed. So the ratio of surface to volume is one over R with some other, what, what pi over three in front or something, whatever. Three over pi, whatever it is. So you can get amorphous metal powders and people tried explosive compaction, they tried all kinds of things. The problem is these amorphous materials, you heat them up, even if it's an iron based alloy, you heat them up to 400 degrees centigrade and they, they crystallize, they transform. It's a non-stable structure. It's a metallic glass. But people have been trying this for years to make ultra-fine structures. Um, last week when I was down at the Army and they were trying to develop new types of armor, not by rapid solidification, but they have a process that the British developed and tried to commercialize 30 years ago where they, they really, it's sort of like kneading the metal. You just, you put 30 times the energy into it and you just, you just, you just squeeze it out this extrusion hole. It comes out, actually you squeeze it this way and it comes out at 90 degrees and it's called the conform process, this commercial process. And you can get some incredible properties. I mentioned the, the trolley wire. The trolley wire they ended up buying from Phelps Dodge for the New Hampshire uh, Boston connection was made by the conform process. Fantastic strength and ductility. Remember we talked about that last time? So, well the Army's been doing this, I won't tell you what type of alloy, but on a, a lightweight alloy. Um, and they get tremendous strength and ductility. It's sort of known you can do this. And um, uh, so this is one of the promising areas for the, uh, what, the ground combat vehicle, which is the Army's new, new uh, thing. Uh, the problem is you can make it into rods because you're extruding it out. But how do you consolidate those rods into a plate? Usually you like your armor to be sort of plate shaped rather than rod shaped, okay? Don't stop a lot of bullets unless they are shooting for your armor, right? They might try to shoot around your armor if it's just a rod shape, right? Um, so you have to have a very cooperative enemy, okay? Uh, shooting for your armor. Um, and so they, so I asked, I raised my hand and I said, well, how are you gonna consolidate this? Oh, we'll worry about that later. I said, that's, that's what they said about rap rapidly solidified powders 30 years ago. And we spent hundreds of millions of dollars and got nowhere. And they said, oh no, we'll solve the problem. I said, good. They couldn't solve that problem before. And, and I quoted George Santayana. Anybody know who Santayana was? He was a philosopher up at Harvard. But one of his sayings was, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Okay. So, but that's, you know, you can get great properties in a little piece of material, okay? It costs a small fortune, but you can sell the next research project on that, okay? Because you're not looking far enough ahead to say, how can I actually make a product out of it? Well, you have made a product out of it. You made a research product out of it, okay? You get more research money to study it until finally you get a manager who's going to kill it. Okay. Um, it's true. I've been watching it for 35 years. Okay. Um, <coughs> there's another process to make <coughs> um, very uh, metal powders. And making metal powders is a good thing because they solidify rapidly. It might be 100 or 1,000 degrees per second. So they may have dendrites, but they're very small. And later I'll quantify those dendrite size. 
the um, micro segregation you get because of the enriched liquid between the dendrites versus the uh, lightly alloyed dendrite, you actually now don't have to wait tens of years to homogenize it in a furnace. You can homogenize it in minutes, okay? Because you could be a thousand times thinner and it goes as the square, and so you'd be a million times faster on your, on your uh, heat treatment times and stuff. So you actually can get good homogeneous material if you rapidly solidify it. Uh, you don't have to get amorphous metal glass, but you can get good material. Well, it turns out one of the things they do is they take a plasma torch. So you've got an electrode here, you've got copper, you have argon, and you're going to heat this material. And um, it doesn't, this actually doesn't show it very well. It actually doesn't show it at all. But it's, I, didn't, I couldn't actually find one. But a company up here in uh, Concord, Massachusetts called Nuclear Metals, uh, which is a spin-off of the MIT Mechanical Engineering Department. Um, uh, and they were actually, they were the, kind of the people making depleted uranium back when we used depleted uranium for rounds. Actually, the Navy may still use it, right? You're not like, huh? Did you stop? Okay. <coughs> yeah, well, very good for ph things like phalanx and stuff, but um, the, the Army had to stop because of the first Gulf War. They kind of contaminated most of Kuwait and southern Iraq with depleted uranium. Uh, and they decided it was environmentally unsound. Well, in any case, all of that depleted uranium was made by extrusion up here at nuclear metals. But one of the things nuclear metals developed about 20 years ago was the rotating electrode process. So you have a, a plasma torch, and you have this ingot of this, you know, it could be a super alloy for jet engines or whatever. You want to make powder out of it. It's very homogeneous, has no, no segregation in the final product. And so you just make this ingot and you, you machine it so that you can spin it at thousands of surface feet per minute. And then you come in and you just like a welding torch, you melt the top of it. But as it's spinning, you sh shoot off as spatter the metal powders and you catch them in your chamber and you get very good. You can get very good metal powders. Not very cheap, but very good. And you can then take those powders and you can forge them, various techniques we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, into something like a, a, a rotor for a jet engine, okay? Excellent homogene homogeneity, excellent properties. Remember, when we talk about some of these things, the applications are going to not be for Ford Tauruses or for ships or railroads, where we're talking about a couple of bucks a pound. They're going to be for jet engines where you're willing to pay $200 a pound, or they're gonna be for aer they're gonna be aerospace applications. If it's space, the value could be $20,000 a pound. We went through all that before. So when we talk about these sophisticated processes where you sort of melt with an arc and spin this electrode, we're not making automotive parts. We're making aerospace parts. But you as managers are going to have people come and say, oh, we got this wonder material, okay? Just like last week at the Army, they got this wonder armor, okay? And they can shoot little bullets of that, and they show that armor is fantastic. The question is, they can never make it into a plate, okay? They can make little things that you can shoot little bullets at, okay? And it stops little bullets just great, but you'll never stop the big stuff because you can't make it big. How do you scale it up, okay? Um... I'll just mention another type of furnace for melting, which is getting way back in time. Oops, I don't know if I want to do it now. This is so dark. Uh, is a reverberatory furnace. This is nothing more than the open hearth furnace, but it's just ooh, now it's too light. Um, I hate this. Uh, the c this control has got like a three-second time delay on it. So here's your. You have a burner with a flame. A furnace exhaust, you just have your molten material down here inside a refractory crucible. This basically is like the old open hearth where they made steel. It is still the way they make float glass today. We talked about float glass on a bed of tin and, and stuff. Just have a flame shooting in, in here and the radiant heat from the flame melts something in here. 
the float glass is being pulled out of that furnace very slowly. Okay, it may be a couple of a foot or two feet per minute. It, you're pulling out this little layer of glass out of the furnace. You just want something to keep everything nice and smooth. You don't want any high uh, turbulence in here that's going to mess up the surface of your of your uh, liquid. Um, so they use a reverberatory furnace. They used it in the old open hearths, but that was bad kinetics. It took you two, a day to make the steel. The basic oxygen was a lot faster, but they still use this for glass melting furnaces. They still use it for a lot of other things. I remember one of my favorite <coughs> uh, grading of doctoral exams was back like my second year on the faculty. And Professor Bowen, who's no longer here, he's retired from Harvard Business School now, but he was a professor of ceramics before he went to Harvard Business School uh, to become a professor up there. He asked a question on the general exam, asking the student to design, the doctoral candidate, to design furnaces for three different types of applications. And so one guy had a reverberatory furnace, but for whatever the application was, he wanted to do it in a vacuum. And so there he had this flame shooting right into the vacuum. He had a picture of it, flame shooting into the vacuum. And uh, I was grading this, this question. Professor Clark, who was in charge of all the things, was in the office next to me. His office was right next to mine. I went over and said, did you make this up? This couldn't be a student's answer, OK? Is this real? And so he and I looked at it, you know, he said, no, 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 he said, he, did, he hadn't, he hadn't, he wasn't trying to pull a fat April Fool's joke on me or anything. It was real. And so we sent it back to Professor Bowen, uh, graded very, with very low score. Uh, but uh, actually, it was the kid's second time around, and he never did get a doctorate. Uh, so MIT does have some standards. Our standards may be low, but we have them, right, as they say. <coughs> Um, another thing is spray casting. Now this actually, this is actually a, something, that's well, not a very great example. Um, <coughs> you like to get um, uh, something that can cool fairly rapidly. And so you can basically take that atomization process and you can, you can come up with a spray gun that has a little arc or a flame and you can shoot out metal powders just like an, an oil burner shoots out a mist of oil. Okay? You turn it into a metal spray gun. And you can then spray that on some mold and you can make different shapes. Now the reason you guys should know about this is NAVC thinks this is one of the greatest repair techniques going. Okay? They got worn out shafts, they got worn out bearings, <coughs> they got worn out all kinds of things. And so you just go in there and you put metal spray all over the surface. Flame spray. Or plasma spray. I mean different heat sources but yeah flame spray you can you can cast you're basically casting by shooting little and this is a picture of a microstructure it'll have some porosity it'll have some inclusions um, hard to do you can well plasma spray you can plasma spray steel uh, but it's very good for bearings copper alloy bearings it's good for aluminum alloys you spray on a thick sort of somewhat porous aluminum coating but great for corrosion resistance okay in some applications yeah well you can machine it afterwards so sometimes they they build it up and machine it back okay um, but it's this is another technology I mean I um, I've sort of over the last 20 years started to try to categorize these things by what's your energy source or what's your so if you got a heat source or you got a uh, certain size that you want to make fine powders great big castings ingots or something and if you start thinking about it we've sort of eliminated most of the possibilities i mean you take electrical energy you know chemical energy thermal energy if you want to heat something up there's only certain types of energy that you can have and someone's, and I kind of do this because in welding, we've often done these things, okay? We've, we've tried virtually every combination of energy source, material, and shape forming, or whatever you're doing, and there's not a whole lot of them left, 
okay? I mean, there's mechanical energy. The big thing, the only new welding process developed, in fact, um, in the last 25 years is what's called friction stir welding. If you look at the 200 welding processes, welding and cutting processes listed in the back of the welding handbook, um, you'll find that 50% uh, of them were developed in the uh, between 1875 and 1925. So there's a hundred of them. Another 50% um, were developed between 1925 and 1970 or 1975. From 1975 to 2000, there was one developed. Okay. Anyway, I don't remember. Maybe it was 150 in the first 50 years, and then. 49 or whatever, something like that. I guess that was what it was. 150 in the first 50 years, 50 in the next 50 years, and then in the last 25 years there's been one new welding process where essentially they just, they call it friction stir welding. They take a, a metal, start out with aluminum, they take a metal electrode, basically like a milling machine, and they just ram it into the surface of the plate between two plates, and they forge them together at room temperature. Now it generates a little friction so it gets warm, but it's a solid state welding process. There's no melting and there's almost no distortion. You know, Boeing put in a $10 million facility to weld the aluminum plates. Well, for the last 20 years, people have been trying to do steel. The problem with steel is there's no electrode material that really works very well, okay? You gotta have something that's still got good mechanical strength at these forging temperatures and doesn't wear out. Well. You can do it with aluminum, you can do it with magnesium alloys, you can do it with a number of things, but uh, the high melting alloys, it's, it gets harder and harder. And so when, when aluminum's only 2% of all metals, it's uh, sort of a limited application, okay? Was flame spraying, when you said the NAFSI interest is laser cutting, is that really just a type of flame spraying? Uh, it's not flame spraying, but it is laser cladding. You're melting the surface. So yes, so rather than spraying a powder, if you just want to take a, a laser or a plasma torch or even a flame and just melt the top surface, okay, that's another way of building up the thing, okay? And those are often machined and, and whatnot. So there's, I mean, almost any variation you can think of people, someone, some guy said, oh, why don't we just kind of put these things together? And sometimes it was a, a great scientist who thought of it, but more often than not, it's like this guy came in with, this, this artist came in with his little lost foam, his styrofoam model that he was pouring sand around. And it's, a lot of the people who do the real invention don't know what they're doing. In fact, the guy who invented the, the jet engine, I have a quote somewhere in my office, he says, because uh, people it, are, was it Lord Kelvin? Anyway, he was quoting some guy, some great scientist from a number of years before, who said that it was impossible to build a, uh, something like a gas turbine. And they didn't call it a gas turbine, but this guy Whipple, who designed the first gas turbine in England in the late 30s, he says it's a good thing he didn't know that this scientific fact was true or he never would have tried. <laughs> okay, um, so people often, it's often someone who doesn't understand things very well that goes ahead and tries something and it ends up working. Now, for every one of those, there's 999 who tried something that didn't work. But, you know, every now and then there's someone who comes along and dumb luck is a great... Uh, flame uh, in the vacuum chamber. Yeah, the flame in the vacuum chamber. You know, <laughs> I just thought, well, you won't get any, you won't get any damage to your part it'll just after a while the oil will just fill up the vacuum chamber and you know be completely preserved in oil right uh, anyway. <laughs> okay well let me take a 10 minute break <coughs> uh, it's but there are people who are what what the the other scientists say very creative people okay yeah okay I guess that's creativity Anyway, let's talk a little bit about gases in metals. Um, well, actually, let me back up. I talked about you got to extract the heat of fusion. You have macro segregation. You get these big dendrites, and then the fluid flow, and you get you know the the high highly alloyed liquid and the lightly alloyed solid that first solidifies. And we might talk about that a little bit more. 
but then you end up worrying about micro segregation. The way you get rid of that is you solidify it rapidly, but then you end up with small, small powders or thin sheets uh, or bulk metallic glasses or, or whatever. And people have tried a lot of different things. But in addition to extracting the heat of fusion, um, you've got to worry about the fact that you can dissolve gases or you get the piping porosity from the ingots that leaves big voids or you can get inclusions in the, in the material. Now the inclusions often form from the gases and the alloying elements. For example, in, if you um, make pure copper and you're making it, uh, you're melting it in a reverberatory type furnace in the air, it'll pick up lots of oxygen that'll dissolve right in the, um, in the copper. The problem is when you solidify it, that, co that oxygen forms copper oxide and you end up with not pure copper as your, as your copper, but copper with peppers of little copper oxide inclusions. And that weakens the copper. It destroys its part of its electrical conductivity, which is one of the things you want out of copper typically, so you're losing some of your properties. And they have all kinds of ways of getting rid of that oxygen. One of the simplest is you throw a little phosphorus in and the phosphorus forms a phosphorus oxide. Now I have phosphorus oxide inclusions, but many of those will float off before you cast it. Not all of them, but you'll, you'll have fewer inclusions with phosphorus deoxidized copper. Um, you can go to uh, oxygen-free high conductivity copper, which is melted in a vacuum furnace. And so you, you basically pull the oxygen out while it's molten because there's no oxygen to dissolve in it. It's kind of like letting your, your Sprite go flat. Okay, the CO2 comes out when you put it in a vacuum, right? Um, so you got to get rid of these dissolved gases in many cases. Now, one good example of dissolved gases is aluminum, aluminum alloys and hydrogen, okay? Now, there's hydrogen is everywhere. We call it water. Okay, there's humidity in the air. If you go down to uh, electric boat, uh, you want to keep the hydrogen out of your steel welds. An electric boat or the Navy, NAVC has a spec that you cannot weld on days that have more than X percent humidity. I don't remember the numbers. They're probably classified anyway. But um, uh, a certain level of humidity um, and a certain temperature in the air because that tells you how much moisture is in the air. And if you're doing uh, stick electrode welding, you're gonna pick up some of that air, it's gonna get hydrogen into the steel and you can get cracking and whatnot. Well, that NAFC spec is violated 80% of the days that they're welding, okay? In fact, you could weld 20% of the time at electric boat or any other shipyard, because there's shipyards tend to be located next to the, a lot of water, for whatever reason, and water creates humidity, okay? And so we have this spec that is just sort of ignored. It's sort of like the Air Force has a spec that if you have a rotor failure on a helicopter, uh, I don't know if it's Air Force or an Army spec, but anyway, the government tends to share these specs now that you have to have a shell around the, the engine compartment for the turbine on the helicopter that will contain the rotor, okay? So it won't go through the, uh, the pilot's compartment and cut him in two and things like that because he doesn't fly as well when he's cut in two. Um, the <laughs> they've done studies on this, <laughs> okay? Uh, probably very expensive studies, but nonetheless. There is no material that can stop a rotor from going through. And well, there are materials, but you're talking about armor. So if you want to put two inch armor plate around your engine, encase your engine in two inch armor plate, that's fine. It's just you can't get your helicopter off the ground, okay? And the FAA has adopted the standard, but no one can meet the standard, so everyone ignores the standard. So it's, this is one of these standards like the Navy's humidity requirement for welding in shipyards, okay? You have to be below a certain relative humidity, and in fact, they never are, or 80% of the time they aren't, so you just ignore the standard because otherwise you couldn't do anything, okay? So it, we, it's almost like we were talking about before. You get 
certain groups of people who can develop standards or ideas and, and they don't look at the practical reality. Anyway, so far as aluminum, if you just take aluminum and you melt it in the air, there's enough humidity in Cambridge that you will pick up a fair amount of hydrogen. This is solubility of hydrogen versus temperature. This is the melting point. And this is actually on a log scale. Hey, this is cubic centimeters per 100 grams. If that was steel, that would be one would be one cubic centimeter for 100 grams. And steel for hydrogen is about one part per, per million. It's like 1.1. In aluminum, it may be um, for 100 grams, it may be three because aluminum's got a third of the density approximately. Anyway, but anyway. Um, Although you got a decrease in temperature too, so I don't know what the conversion is. Maybe it's only two. But in any case, we're talking about having um, uh, a number of parts per million of, a, of hydrogen in the aluminum. Well, hydrogen uh, in parts per million, hydrogen is pretty light compared to aluminum, so it's a lot of parts per atom, okay? Uh, atomic percent. It's like uh, 0 .03 or something atomic percent. Anyway, so it dissolves a lot, and then the solubility drops by about a factor of 15 when it solidifies. So you're going to give off the gas. If you were to try to take seltzer water with CO2 in it and turn it into ice, you would find uh, that you would give off a lot of gas as it solidifies because you can't dissolve as much CO2 in the ice as you can in the, in the liquid uh, uh, water. So the problem is, you'll always end up, unless you degas it with some porosity when you solidify your aluminum alloys. And in fact, there are ASTM specs, if I could have brought reference radiographs, where you'll have a little bit of porosity or a lot of porosity in an aluminum weld or an aluminum casting. Um, the best quality is something where you can find some little like 10 mil inclusions and if you had a little one inch square you might have 10 of these little inclusions per square inch or something on a for a quarter inch thick aluminum or something anyway there's some standards for it the worst is you got quarter inch holes in your aluminum um, now how do you get rid of it well back in the old days when i was a student and working in the foundry at mit we just took some chlorine gas and we had a little steel lance and we'd stick it in there and we bubble some chlorine through and the chlorine would react with the hydrogen and aluminum form hydro hydrogen chloride gas which we just blew off into the air in Cambridge. Uh, they don't let us do that anymore. How do you do gas your aluminum now? <laughs> uh, we've used uh, hexachloroethane. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. Right, so they don't care if they get porosity because they're just making little medallions for MIT students and stuff, and who cares? They're not going to cut them open and see they look like Swiss cheese on the inside. Um, but if you're trying to make a high quality casting, you've got to degas it. And yes, this hexachloroethanes, basically they'll have liquids rather than gases because it's sort of messy to be fooling around with chlorine gas in the foundry, okay? Someone pour something or they cut the rubber cable and you all of a sudden have a chlorine leak, you know, in the room and yeah, it's messy. Um, lose more undergraduates that way. Um, anyway, <laughs> hey, you got to remember, back when I was a student, I was saw cutting transite, okay, on the bandsaw with no mask or anything because, you know, uh, transite's asbestos plate, okay. Um, <laughs> I've always figured if I ever get asbestosis, I can sue MIT. I can't as a faculty member because I'm an employee, but as a student, I wasn't an employee. Uh, okay. So there's a deep pocket there if I ever get asbestosis. Um, anyway. Um, and we had asbestos gloves, and they were always just falling apart, holes in the fingers. We, you go around the foundry for for 20 minutes looking for a pair of gloves that didn't have holes in the fingers, you know. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Uh, anyway. So you got this problem of gases and metals. So it can be oxygen and copper, it can be hydrogen and aluminum, um, it can be hydrogen and steel, it can be oxygen and steel. Uh, different alloy 
systems have different gases that are uh, a concern to them. You can bubble nitrogen through, you can bubble argon through, and those bubbles will help pull out some of those things. It's like the argon oxygen decarbonization. You bubble argon through to get the carbon and oxygen coming out as carbon monoxide. So you can degas by bubbling something through or that ethane, that hexachloroethane is a liquid, right? In a little. Oh, it's a pellet. Okay, it's solid. Okay. Um, I have seen people put vials of liquid, you know, submerge it underneath the thing. <coughs> and you get a nice little boil going on. I mean, you start boiling the metal. I mean, you're, you're generating bubbles of gas, but those bubbles of gas are carrying away the harmful gas. Um, this is hy hydrogen solubility in different aluminum alloys as a function of temperature. And if you have lots of magnesium, it's a lot worse. Uh, magnesium will dissolve more hydrogen than, than aluminum. Um, and so we have lots of different bu bubbling studies, okay, to how do you get bubbles in the metal that you want to help pull things out and, and whatnot. Now, so you, ordinarily you're trying to get rid of it. Here's an example where you go the exact opposite direction. And a lot of times you come up with some pretty clever things. If whatever the conventional is, wisdom is, you want to get all the gas out. Here's foamed aluminum. It's made basically a similar type of process to making styrofoam. Styrofoam, you take molten plastic and you inject a bunch of, actually they used to use Freon, they're probably using some, some hydrocarbon gas now. You don't, you don't inject oxygen or air into a molten plastic, it tends to burn, okay? So you inject something in that, that won't cause a, uh, burning. But this, in this case, I think they foamed it with nitrogen. Okay, very light. It has all the strength of a piece of styrofoam too. Okay, uh, so don't, pull it, don't push on it too hard, okay? Uh, but uh, no one's really found a good application for this. Okay, but it's easy to make, okay? Yeah, it is sort of cool, right? I mean, there was Professor Gibson had a big project on this stuff. They had, they had sheets of this stuff four or five inches thick, about four or five feet wide, you know, or plates of this stuff. Huh? We still have them. You still have them? Yeah, okay. Them. Yeah, well, no one else has either. But, you know, hey, they made it, right? And I'm sure they got a few million dollars to make it. And anyway, they never figured out an application for it. But that is kind of going the opposite direction where you put gases in. Uh, now another guy around here had a bright idea once. He wanted to melt the metal, various metals, under a gas, a uh, high pr higher pressure of a gas, and drive more of the gas in to dissolve in the molten metal. And then he was going to atomize it. So those little drops, he's going to atomize it in a vacuum chamber. And so all that extra solubility of gas was going to cause the drops to explode. So you get even finer metal powders. Okay, it's hard to get metal powders smaller than about 30 microns. And he started a company. Uh, and actually he was able to do it, but I'm not sure the economics ever worked out. Or the, he really found an application for powders that are that fine. <coughs> you don't always like to have metal powders that are, it's hard to get metal powders less than about 30 micron in size, it's about one thousandth of an inch. 25 microns is one thousandth of an inch. Does anybody know why, if you get down to five and ten, ten micron power, powders, why you don't like to, they're a problem? Pardon me? Uh, yeah, but before you even breathe them in, they tend to be pyrophoric. There's enough surface area, they really burn really well. I mean, and you've seen a metal vapor, a metal, a metal powder fire. You've been to fireworks demonstrations, okay? You've seen incendiary, you know, flares and things like that. That's nothing more than a metal powder fire, okay? Or you've seen rockets take off, right? A solid rocket motor, that's a metal powder fire. You just get small, fine metal powders, lots of surface volume ratio, heat them up a little bit, and you get some really good fires. In fact, we don't have any Coast Guard folks here, but Professor Sadaway had a big project once that someone was transporting a bunch of old machine turnings in a big barge, and they were going to take them to the steel mill for scrap, and they, the, the barge caught on fire. I mean, it's not easy to put out a metal fire, okay? Um, what is it called? Blue? Uh, I can't remember. 
it's blue something. The, there is a salt, it's sort of like a sodium chloride salt, but you can't, you can't put water on a metal fire because it reacts with the, the water, re the oxygen reacts with the metal and gives off a gas called hydrogen. And now in the fire, that hydrogen will sometimes go boom as you give it, give it off. So <coughs> if you actually, in fact, I had, I've had a couple of cases of titanium fires. Uh, one of them was in New York City not long after 9-11, just down a few blocks down. And these guys were cutting up a heat exchanger in the basement of a building that was titanium. And so they got all these people, none of them could speak English because they could get them for a, a nice low wage. And they gave them torches and they were going in there cutting up this huge titanium heat exchanger. Flame cutting it. Um, well, when you do that, you create some fine powders, not of all, some of which may be completely combusted, but maybe some others didn't. Uh, but in any case, when things would get a little too hot, they had a garden hose and they would spray the garden hose on there. And these guys, they didn't speak much English, but they noticed when they sprayed the garden hose, sometimes the flames got bigger rather than smaller. <laughs> it's because they're generating hydrogen. <laughs> okay, they're oxidizing the titanium and generating hydrogen. So they were doing this for a couple of days, and one Saturday, the third day, Saturday morning, um, they were, this, all the heat that's building up in the bottom of this vessel, they're cutting out the titanium tubes and the heat exchanger, starts getting worse and worse, and when they spray water on it, well, the flame was getting bigger and bigger, and they keep trying to spray water on it, and it didn't seem to be doing any good. In fact, it made the flame bigger. And so finally they decided maybe they should call the fire department, okay? And uh, the fire department chief comes down to the third level of this basement and he sees this big flame there and he sees them, what they're doing, and I think the chief probably knew about metal fires. And they ordered the, the truck, the city of New York owns one truck with this blue, I can't remember, the, not blue goose, but it's some sort of name like that which is the, the uh, material to put out metal fires. And they keep it at LaGuardia Airport because that's where you might have a metal fire from an aircraft that crashes or something. So they're bringing in this truck of metal vapor, you know, which is just a, a salt, okay? Because, you know, like sodium chloride won't burn, okay? And you can smother a fire uh, with sodium chloride. You can't smother a fire with sand not a titanium fire, because it will take the oxygen from the silicon, <laughs> okay? You actually generate more heat. And actually, titanium and silicon form a very stable alloy, and give off heat. Um, so anyway, as they're waiting for this thing to get in there, they have a small little hydrogen explosion in the basement. Uh, doesn't do a lot of terrible damage, but does a few million dollars worth of damage. And so now the people are suing the fire department in New York because they didn't put out the fire. Well, these guys have been generating the fire for three, three days without any help. And they called, finally, when they got out of control, they decided to call in the fire department and then they blamed the fire department for not, how, not knowing how, or not being able to control it. But anyway, it's an interesting theory, uh, at least I think, on things. Um, so anyway, there's, we have to worry about the gases. You end up with porosity. Uh, there are various specs for the amount of allowable porosity, but again, you saw the football size defect in the 33-inch diameter shaft. Um, if you, the, the smaller the, the casting, the, the smaller the defect, okay? Now, um, we do various things because you also get inclusions. The inclusions, the difference between a pour and an inclusion is inclusion has just got some solid material in there. Typically, it's a ceramic, and it might be some ceramic like in steel, to get rid of the oxygen, you can throw some silicon in the steel, which will form SiO2, basically molten quartz, okay? Um, or actually might form, you so throw some manganese and some silicon in, you, ha you get a manganese silicate, which is a liquid in the liquid steel. And now you have these little inclusions. When those little inclusions can degrade the fatigue strength in particular, and so we have to do things to get rid of the inclusions. Um, and some of the things we do are we pour it through a, 
we we pour it and we pour it through something so the metal becomes fa fairly shallow and I have a slag on the top a molten glass and hopefully the inclusions will come up to the surface and the they'll be absorbed into the glass layer the slag on top uh, that doesn't work perfectly um, so one of the things you can do is you can cast an ingot and then you can vacuum arc remelt it if you vacuum arc remelt then hopefully um, in the vacuum you'll get rid of some of that stuff one of the things that again this was a big Air Force project um, they were trying to build a 10 million dollar prototype facility and actually I think they may have been successful they wanted to make titanium powders for aircraft parts that were very clean and so there's basically electron beam or laser surface melting so you have a water-cooled copper hearth you bring in a uh, horizontal bar, in this case the Air Force doing titanium, but this could be a nickel-based super alloy to make some aircraft part. And you, uh, they like to use electron beams because you can get a lot of heat intensity in here on this water-cooled copper hearth and they overheat it and you're basically starting on the surface to vaporize some of the material and you actually will preferentially vaporize some of these ceramic inclusions in there. In fact, a guy at the Naval Research Laboratory a number of years ago went, who had a big 25 uh, kilowatt laser back in the 70s, which was the biggest laser you could buy commercially. Um, they had, the Air Force had bigger ones, but you couldn't, you couldn't even talk about them commercially, okay? Um, they had, the, the, the Air Force's laser weapons back then were about 50 megawatts, but that's classified, but I didn't know anything about it, but you can figure out by three different techniques in the open literature. Um, one is they were trying to build a superconducting generator that had a 50 megawatt output. Well, that was, that was going to fly in a plane and power a laser, or you could figure that out. Another was Professor Bowen, about the time that I came back as a faculty member, had this big project to make halide glass windows about, about two or three feet in diameter. And if you knew what the laser power density was that would, these were gonna be windows for high power lasers. And if you knew what the damage tolerance was for the power density of the laser light going through, you could calculate and it just so happened you get about 50 megawatts, okay? Uh, how was the other, there was another way. I don't remember what the other way was, but it turns out the other thing about it, I, I remember in the early 80s, I uh, had a friend worked for Rockwell International, and he was a laser expert. And I said, "Hey, Charlie, uh, I've kind of figured through these other things. The Air Force, uh, the laser weapons must be on the order of 50 megawatts." And he said, "Well, Tom, I can't really tell you because that's classified, and Rockwell is the prime contractor for the Air Force on this." And he says, "But uh, I will tell you that the size of the weapon fits in the space shuttle cargo bay, and that was how they sized the space shuttle." Okay, or so I guess they probably sized both of them, but they that was one of the ways in the in the late 60s They knew approximately what size Space shuttle they wanted to build just happened to be one that could carry a laser weapon into space. Okay, okay. Um, So you can learn all kinds of things if you just kind of know the open literature anyway um, So they they heat this thing it superheats on the surface what Ed Metzbauer did at Naval Research Laboratory He was welding HY-80 steel with a laser and he went in and he found that the weld metal was cleaner than the base metal that he was welding. And he figured out that what was happening is the superheating from the laser beam in the weld metal was vaporizing all the inclusions. And so he got better properties in the weld metal than he had in the base plate because he was getting rid of all these little inclusion particles. So one of the things that the Air Force would, will do that makes very expensive metal is to remelt the material and then just let it solidify in here but they could do this in a vacuum um, they can have another beam rotating on top of the pool to keep the liquid anyway they you know it's a fairly expensive facility uh, but they were building this thing one of these for titanium uh, about 20 years ago right over here in Worcester Massachusetts at the Wyman Gordon facility okay um, we do all kinds of things in the castings to put filters in. Now this is typically for aluminum alloys or copper alloys to get rid of the inclusions. You basically, this is your, 
you'll pour the metal in here, this is your runner, you're going to have your casting down here, and they put in um, a filter, okay, you just put a filter in the, in the thing and the filters are various types of ceramic. I don't have a ceramic metal filter, but I do have a ceramic catalytic converter, which is just, you can make some fairly complex shapes out of ceramic. This is just a bunch of square holes in a, not a checkerboard pattern, but a, a, a pattern. And this is a catalytic converter, all the gases go through. That's the support for the platinum catalyst in a car. It's kind of an old one. But they actually will make those and plug up half the holes for diesel engine filters now. Okay? And so all the uh, ash particulate that goes through, they make, basically make a filter and all they do is trap the, uh, the powders and stuff. You can make fairly fine, um, um, you can make it a lot finer than that, but you can make various uh, ceramic filters that uh, will hopefully filter out the inclusions. However, if you get great big castings, sometimes your filters or your mold wall will actually fall in and in a big casting, a couple of feet in diameter, you could have inclusions the size of your fist. I always say you, can, you might find a brick in the middle of your casting because sometimes those things fall in during the casting process. It's not always people that fall in, sometimes it's material that falls in and if it gets frozen in then you can have, that's why the the best quality casting you can measure with ultrasonics has to fit within a six inch diameter circle, okay? Because you can, that's, that's just the way it is, folks. Um, now, so we have inclusions, which once they get in there, you gotta remelt it to get it out of there. That's electro slag remelting, vacuum arc remelting. And for the, the best, well actually not just the best, but well, it's sort of the best. Even for, for aircraft landing gear, for the shafts and the rotors, for commercial um, materials, typically it's two vacuum arc remelting. So you make it, you cast it once by vacuum induction melting to get rid of all the inclusions or get it down, the impurities down as low as possible. You then do this type of vacuum induction melting or vacuum arc remelting to vaporize off all these inclusions and then you do it again. And I've heard of people trying it a third time but you start to get to the law of diminishing returns. But typically aircraft landing gear for a 747 or any commercial aircraft is double vacuum arc remelted. Um, and one of the reasons is you want to get your imperfections down less than about 10 microns in size. When you get to the strength levels of 250 KSI, you go through your fracture mechanics and you start finding flaws that are uh, 100 microns in size, you know, thickness of a sheet of paper, uh, can be harmful for fatigue life and other things. So the rotors for the engines, the shafts for the engines, the landing gear, um, expensive material, you're talking stuff that's going to be hundreds of dollars a pound because of all this extra processing. Now the um, you can tolerate some inclusions, but one of the problems is the porosity um, can be particularly harmful. You try to degas it, you add alloying elements to fo that form inclusions, you try to vacuum, you stir it with gas going through it, other gas going through it. You all do all these things and you still end up with a casting that still has some porosity. It doesn't have the best properties in the world. And what you'd like to do is get rid of that. One way to get rid of it is to squeeze it out at high temperatures after you've made the casting. This is the porosity, the little black specks in there. Um, you can make it much better if you put it in this big pressure vessel and, well, I'll, I'll draw it quickly. Um, it's called hot isostatic pressing. It was developed at Battelle Memorial Institute right after World War II. The first unit was at Bell. The second one in the world was right, well, the room that you have your refrigerator in, okay? Um, was the second hot isostatic press about 1950. Professor Grant, this guy who did all this powder metallurgy, had one 
in about 1985, I got a brand new hot isostatic press. I put it in that room and uh, saw Professor Grant in the hallway and said, hey Nick, we got a hip, a hip unit. He said, oh you did? He said, I, said, I took him in and showed it. He says, that's the same spot where the second one in the world was. He had had it there in the early 1950s. I had it there in 1985. Um, Anyway, so hot isostatic press, press, uh, pressing, you basically just take a big pressure vessel, and maybe on Monday I'll tell you, because I'm not going to be here tomorrow. Um, you just have a big cylinder, and inside here, you basically pump in argon gas at maybe 2,000 PSI, because you can pump the gas at, at that pressure. And you do everything cold, you seal all this off, and then you start to heat it up to maybe 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And that 2,000 PSI goes to 20,000 PSI. Some units will go to 30,000 PSI. Well, what do we mean by, by this? How close are those atoms when I start getting a gas? I mean, we generate these pressures. You can't pump 20,000 PSI you generate it by pumping in 2000 and heating it up and letting just normal PV is equal to NRT although it's not a real gas, it's a real gas not an ideal gas anymore but nonetheless if you remember I I told you that going from a liquid state to a vapor state is about a, at room temperature is about a factor of a thousand if you take the cube root of a thousand the distance between atoms at room temperature is about ten atom distances Okay. So if I go to, um, let's just take an easy number like 15,000 PSI, that's a, 100 atmospheres, right? No, 1,000 atmospheres. Well, at 1,000 atmospheres, I can condense, condense this thing, at least at room temperature, and I'm not at room temperature anymore, to where it's got the same density as the liquid. It's a gas, according to thermodynamics, but you've got the atoms as close together as they are in a liquid and you really can't get them much closer together sometimes I've seen some units that go to about 30,000 psi and that's sort of the limit that you can compress gases because at that point they got the same density as a liquid and you can't get them much closer than that okay or at least the pressure is hard to do it if you do that and you heat this thing up to 2000 degrees you put a metal part in there let's say you've got a aluminum casting yeah the volume doesn't change in this vessel? No, not inside. Uh, the same mass of gas in there. Yep. How do you get the atoms more close together? Michigan moving or something? Oh, yeah, well, actually, well, there, well. The average distance. The average the distance between them. So it's just a function of the velocity. Right, right, it's a function of the velocity. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Okay, sorry. Okay, now I see your problem. Okay, yeah. You, there, you, due to the kinetic theory of gases, you can prove their velocity is such they're still a gas. Okay, and there still is a separation. But you actually, at 2,000 psi, you have, you, I guess you keep, for a while, you keep pushing something in there. Um, uh, but anyway, that's how they get to the 20,000. Actually, I have to ask somebody. You have to add some more volume, some more stuff. Yeah, okay. Well, I, I'm going to have to ask somebody because it's a good point. But anyway, if you run through the numbers, you basically are getting things that are getting to near liquid densities at those temperatures and those pressures, okay? In any case, the... Uh, um, in fact, I, I have to rethink that anyway, a little bit. Anyway, the, the thing is, you're just the metal gets soft, just like a, um, a, a uh, forging in the foundry, okay, and not the foundry, but the blacksmith shop, the metal gets so soft, but you're, you're going to squeeze it isostatically from all directions. It's just like being at the bottom, bottom of the ocean, you've got pressure from all directions, and you're going to squeeze that porosity out as the metal becomes plastic at a high temperature. And you go from the picture at the top to the picture at the bottom. And you can take complex shapes, let's say, anybody here ride Harleys? Okay, but if you've ridden a motorcycle, the Harley, the engine block's aluminum. It's got all these fins on it, okay? They cast that. Now, 
you, you'd like to know that that's not going to blow up when they have those little explosions going on in there. It's not a good day, particularly where it's located, right there between your knees, right? Um, so it turns out each one of those cylinders is hot isostatically pressed, okay? And that's why you're paying a little more for that engine as compared to other engines. They don't bother to do that on an aircraft engine, which is also a finned aluminum cylinder head, because you lose one cylinder engine, well, it's a big deal, you lose your engine, okay? You can glide down, okay? But on a motorcycle, it's a little more critical, okay? Um, so, in any case, we do hot isostatically press things like that. It turns out every single, uh, well, not every single, but many of the rotor blades, some of the, the rotors that, that, take, that hold these uh, turbine blades, some of the alloys can't be forged. Some of them can, we'll talk about that on Monday, but some of them can't be forged, they can only be cast but you can't tolerate pores that would be a millimeter in diameter and these things are big enough castings weighing 10 tons or whatever when they start out um, that you would have big pores and so they're going to hot isostatically press those and so about 15 years ago uh, I, I'll tell you this story, I'll give you the, pre the preface the world's largest hot isostatic press was located up here in North Andover, Massachusetts the cylinder weighed 200 tons. The top, it was actually beveled on the side, kind of came down just to save steel, like this on the side wall. The top was 17 inches thick. The main wall was 10 inches thick. It let go one night. And one 16 ton piece from this 200 ton vessel, the caps were about 25 tons each and they were just threaded in. Um, one 16-ton piece was found a quarter of a mile away. Okay, so hey, you know, you guys in the battleship business, that's no big deal. You know, they can lob shells a lot more than a quarter mile, and some of them can be pretty heavy. But this was more than they usually do in North Andover. Okay, uh, and so we'll talk next time about why it failed. Okay, uh, but the other interesting thing about this, at the time it failed. It was the world's largest hot isostatic press. To build another one, to get the forgings and everything, would have been three years. This was the only one at the time it failed, the only one in the world that would take the 60 inch diameter rotors from some of the major aircraft, okay? Fortunately, the company that owned this had decided about Two and, two and a half years before this to make another one. And the other one actually came online, was scheduled to come online three months after this one blew up. But we almost had a situation where we would not have been able to make aircraft engine rotors anywhere in the world for three years. But it was only three months, okay? But they dodged a bullet on that one. Can you imagine what that would have been a problem for a lot of, not just, not just the commercial industry, but the military and everybody else. And certainly Harleys would have been, old Harleys would have been a lot more valuable because you couldn't, wouldn't have been able to buy new ones. In fact, I remember going out there to the plant. I was one of the first two guys in the pit. Okay, they had a crane after the, after they got all the, the building that kind of lost its top and walls and everything else. They had to clear it up for about two, two or three days. And finally, they, the, the head guy from Traveler's Insurance and I were the first two guys in the pit. They took a crane and just lowered us into the pit to look at this thing, what was left down there. Um, but I remember looking over in the corner and they had this rack of Harley cylinders, okay? And a few other parts and stuff, but I, that's when I learned that Harley hips their, their cylinders. So, okay, let's see if 